Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to today's History Hack. I've got Zach with me today. Hello, Zach. Hello, boss, the history fan back in the house. How are you doing? Not bad, not bad. I'm so excited. I, I was excited about the interview, but I'm more excited because there's a puppy in the house. Yeah, but you don't like dogs because one tried I know, to eat I know, I like you. spaniels. I like spaniels. This is a good choice. I think I I'm winning. Like big dogs. I think I'm converting you to the dark side. But yes, yeah. there is a, a gorgeous King Charles Cavalier Spaniel in the house. Charlie will be very jealous that she's not here for this one. Yeah. Hello, Betsy. Uh, but we, we do have a guest as well. Betsy comes. <laughs> I mean, that is Dorian. <laughs> yeah, the, the, that is kind of the point of this one. <laughs> yeah. We are joined by Caroline Bogus rolf who's a writer and lecturer and is the author of two titles, The Baltic Story and the Adriatic, which covers the 2000 year history. Well, OK, the, the region's been around a lot longer than 2000 years, but we're going to focus on the t- last 2000 years of its history, which is a massive achievement to try and condense all of that into one title. Caroline, welcome to History Hack. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me today. I'm fine. Thank you. I just hope my dog's going to behave well. <laughs> I think she's she's that cute, people, that we will have to forgive her. We're definitely going to have her worked into the cartoon for this episode, I think, because she's just too cute not to. Um, I mean, we've had guinea pigs in cartoons before, so I think pets yeah. are becoming a running thing. Yeah, everyone's like, but yeah, well, we've had a uh, English bulldog as well at one point. So yeah, Bet- Betsy will be immortalised in cartoon form as well. Um <laughs> You've already mentioned, Zach, it's a really bold thing to try and tell 2,000 years of history for such a rich and diverse region in one book. Caroline, what made you want to do it? Well, it sort of really just developed on its own. Um, After I had written the one on the Baltic, I was asked if I would consider doing another similar book. And what really fascinated me about both these regions was that they are... um, (laughs) A sort of a, a crucible of, of so much history, um, but a, a mixture between being a border area and an area of contact. Um, I mean, when I say a border area, I, I'm sort of remembering that the um, the this the, the the it really marked the Adriatic, marked the divide between the Eastern and Western Roman empires, then between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church. Uh, later between the uh, Islamic world of the Ottoman Empire and the West, and finally even the the communist, a non-communist world. So that was a sort of divide. But at the same time, there was such a sort of strong contact through, uh, obviously, territorial competition and and religious competition, but commerce and even um, rather strange uh, alliances that would come and go as the sort of pragmatic uh, uh, partakers decided to join forces or not, whichever it was. I mean, particularly I've noticed this with Venice often being condemned for uh, uh, allying with the, the Ottomans and then the next minute uh, fighting against them. So it's this sort of mixture of a contact and a, and a border area um, that really fascinated me. And I sort of liked the idea of looking at it on, in the sort of long uh, term. I didn't originally set out to write over a 2000 year year period, but that just developed by itself. But it was trying to see how the past affected not just the people at the time, but also later generations. I mean, we see this today in our own politics, the way that this whole political idea about, I don't want to go into modern politics, but the idea of the um, Northern Irish Protocol is is complicated by the past history. And it's the same here that you find that the the history affected later generations. Um, So that, uh, for example, uh, when in the the 20th century, you had the two Italian dictators, uh, D'Annunzio and Mussolini, both of them were looking back to their Roman past to sort of give their, uh, the Italians their identity, whether it was building great Roman sort of style buildings as Mussolini did, or just 
uh, um, D'Annunzio claimed, oh, well, there's a sort of geographical connection with the Eastern Mediterranean, and it was where the Romans were, we, but we own this. So that's really what I'm trying to sort of look at in this way. But at the same time, uh, looking at it through, through individuals, because I always feel that the human story is what makes history come alive. If we just look at events, we, we don't really, really understand what's going on. It's how those events not only affected people, but how people affected the events. And that I find particularly interesting. So, I mean, this is why uh, I, I, each chapter tries to look at some particular individual, whether it's somebody like Catherine Sforza or the Contatieri or whatever. I'm trying to make it a more human story. I think that's going to go down very well with our History Hack listeners, to be honest. We, we like the human in the history as opposed to just some stuff happened um, which it, which is important, but it's it's not kind of the most fascinating element. No, but well, before... I mean, these people made the same mistakes as we do today. I mean, one of the, the, the quotations I particularly liked and I brought in twice into the book was that of, of the Archduke Maximilian of um, Austria, who, you know, the later highly unfortunate uh, um, emperor of Mexico, who was eventually executed uh, but he he had his own prejudices just as we all have but he realized he had them and, and I like the way he said you know later generations are going to look back and be horrified by some of the things we've done so uh, we have to sort of approach it with a sort of humility realizing they made their mistakes but so do we absolutely it's that great line that James Holland came out with recently that I just keep repeating you know history doesn't repeat itself but patterns of human behavior do Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, but before we talk about people, I do want to talk about geography a minute, um, mm. and, and particularly landscape, because I think, and perhaps this is just my perception, but you say the Adriatic, and there's a sort of image that people have, which is usually sort of Dubrovnik, Croatia um, kind of region of stunning landscape, but very rugged landscape. You know, you've got the sea then you've got the mountains and the mountains almost fall into the sea and the people exist in a very narrow space in between. Um, how accurate kind of is that? And how does the geography sort of shape the lives of the people living in that region? Well, I think, as you say, when people say, oh, I'm going to the Adriatic, they most of them say, think in terms of going down the Croatian, the beautiful Croatian or Dalmatian coast and um, all its islands and its lovely uh, inlets and all the rest of it. Uh, but they're forgetting that the Adriatic coast has got, uh, the Adriatic has got an east and west coast. And of course, the Italian uh, Adriatic side uh, is, is very different. It's, it's a long plain that stretches from, um, I mean, anybody who's been to Venice knows the sort of lagoon area there, and then down through the Po Valley, right on down into Puglia, where you have these vast plains of, of, of these wonderful olive trees, of course, they're suffering at the moment so it's it's a totally different scene on that side um so it's almost two separate worlds uh, uh and how much did it affect the people well i think the thing is um uh, of course nowadays uh, uh the, probably the most important industry you're going to get it, it, it for, for a lot of the areas is actually tourism um and so in the east coast i think that is very much where um uh, a lot of people are involved in in in, in the, the tourist industry possibly uh, well puli has become very much more popular in the last few years i mean when i first went there in 1969 it was a very different place uh you used to drive along the coast road and you could see the villages approaching uh, um, and now it's much more built up I mean, that doesn't mean to say it's not a, still a fascinating place and with some lovely areas you, you, you can discover but it's it's uh, tourism has come quite late to Puglia in, in the same way as it perhaps has done along the Adriatic coast or, or the, the eastern Adriatic coast. Um, and even, of course, even in the days of, of um, Yugoslavia, uh, Tito still allowed a certain degree of, of, um, uh, of, of tourism. So it's, it's, it's got quite a history of tourism, that side, I think we might say. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> But it's certainly there's a difference between the two coasts. You just mentioned there um, how much it's changed since you've been going there. How mm. is 
daily life changing has the industry evolved over over the years especially I'm thinking mostly of the role of the sea in their lives um gosh, well uh, I think of course the thing that, that's changed a lot in the last few years I was talking about uh, the last uh, uh, as you can hear I'm a uh, I'm, a, I'm a sort of post-war baby, so I'm a pretty old woman now. But um, uh, it's changed a lot since I went there in, this, in the 60s. Um, but I think uh, in the last 20 years or so, probably the, the, the cruise industry has changed things a tremendous amount. Um, there are pe- people now going to new areas that they would not have discovered before. Um, you can even now go to Albania, which, you know, was certainly, and that's, I know, not the Adriatic, but this book, doesn't stick rigidly to, uh, rigidly to the Adriatic because people and armies and, <laughs> and even cruise boats all spread out a bit more. But um, I think it has changed a lot. Uh, there's, there's industry down in the south of Italy too. But uh, I mean, I particularly uh, one thinks of, of the industry that's grown up over the last um, 200 years in, in the north. Uh, there's a lot more up there. But... Um, I I I I found the people when when I went the funny the last time I went to Puglia was only in 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 2018 just before the lockdown and it was certainly there was a, a growth of interest but there's a lot of areas which are still undiscovered. It's always the challenge, isn't it, trying to protect the undiscovered areas whilst also okay. opening these regions up to people so that they can enjoy them. Um, exactly exactly it's it's yes how i mean one's seen this with venice how now it's having to begin to sort of forbid cruise ships to come in because it was just and there's some talk i think that people are going to have to pay um a a tax certainly if they just go for the day and they're not putting anything into the local economy well this is the red sea um they with akaba the cruise ships that come in for petra they Mm. have to spend one night in wadi musa they have to contribute to the local economy. So they literally have to come in, stay the night, go to Petra and then go back to their cruise ship. Um, they're exactly. not allowed to just come in for the day um, and, and not put into the restaurants and the hotels and stuff exactly, like that. Exactly, because, I mean, these cruise ships have got such wonderful facilities on board. People don't actually feel any need to go to the restaurants on, on shore or anything. They don't spend anything there. And just their footfall adds to the sort of uh, the wear and tear of the city. So um, I think it's going to happen more and more now. I mean, again, we lived in Italy for a long time. And in those days, um, when we were living in Rome, we could just walk into the museums or whether in Florence, Rome, anywhere. Now you have to book to get into these places. So this is the the challenge is to balance tourism with preserving the, um, the character of the place. You mentioned the R word, Rome. Yes. Um, that, the Roman history is is obviously pretty kind of important in, in the grand scheme of all of this, and it's it's an it's a good place to start. It's where you start in your book, the region becomes the scene of some pretty significant events in the rise and fall of the empire. You talked earlier about how it beca- the Adriatic becomes sort of the boundary, if you will, between Eastern and Western uh, Roman empires. Talk us through some of those those big events that kind of happen in the Adriatic region and, and their impact are quite significant impacts in some cases on on the history of well wider Europe. Yes, well, um, I, I originally actually what I was thinking I, I hadn't planned to start with the Romans. I mean, that was quite, as you say, quite a bold move to go back so far, and the Roman history is lost for several centuries and it's very complex. So I did just introduce it as basically as a <laughs> preface to book to explain what was going to happen afterwards and then in it, as it were I could sort of hang later events on on the first sort of hooks I'd put up with introducing the Roman Empire um, but the three three events that I particularly mentioned of the of the early Romans anyway not not the later Romans uh, were the, the um the big battle of, of Kainai that happened in um, 216 BC uh, in Puglia when Hannibal defeated the Romans. Um, and what I think was very interesting when I was researching this, I discovered that even during the first Iraq war, there were certain generals who were looking at the uh, tactics of the battle of Kainai to get some ideas. So it was 
really, really uh, uh, of essential importance, that battle, and it, uh, and it crushed the Romans. It was a sort of real shock to them to be defeated by the Carthaginians, and even the local people began to wonder if they were sort of backing the wrong side. Um, they, they, they then um, recovered their position, the Romans, later. But that was one of the big events. The uh, next one was, of course, the, the famous crossing of the Rubicon, which one hears so much about. And this was a very sort of insignificant little river south of Ravenna. But where it was insignificant as a river, it wasn't as a border because it marked the border between uh, Gaul um, and the Roman Empire, the sort of Rome itself. Where, uh, and so any um, general marching with his army into, into the area under the Rome sort of um, administration was actually committing a sort of act of treason, as it were. And this is why, of course, when Caesar decides he's going to go and take on um, his rival, Pompey, uh, and he crosses the Rubicon, this is why he fam- says his famous thing, the die is passed. He realised he's basically started a sort of civil war. Um, so that was a very sort of important thing that happened actually in this area. Um, and another one I, I, I mentioned, it's not strictly the Adriatic, but as I say, I do cheat a little bit and spread out, out from it. But when it's an important event, I feel about like it's um, was when um, uh, uh, Antony and Cleopatra were defeated at the Battle of Actium. This was about 18 years after the, the crossing of the Rubicon. Um, and again, this is where I love history because it's moving the whole time. These things aren't fixed in the past. And recently, um, these academics have found that uh, there's a, perhaps a reason why uh, and, and Mark Antony did so badly. His boats got sort of trapped, as it were, in the currents and, and, and the size of the boats got, couldn't cope. in in moving and they seem to be stationary Um, and again that sort of brings back the fact that you're you're restricted by the currents and things it makes one realize how incredibly difficult those early battle naval battles must have been when it's all just manpower and and wind power and uh, and you you can't always do the things you want to do you might have got the right motives in in mind but it you can't, can't carry them out So that was another sort of interesting turning point that happens basically in this region. But then having done face the preface, I then in the book move on in the first chapter to looking at the the later Romans and the end really of the the Western Empire because after uh, Constantine had founded his new capital at Constantinople, the the, the, uh, empire divided between the Latin and Greek or Byzantine, whatever you like to call Eastern Empire. And um, it was in that period uh, that when the, uh, the, the empires begin to sort of divide up, we, we look, well, actually in the introduction, I have mentioned, of course, Diocletian and his Tetrarchy at the, um, when he, he divides it up between sort of two Augustus and two Caesars. But uh, once the book starts, I start looking on the first of my sort of individuals I'm trying to explore with Gala Placidia in um, in Ravenna. And she was, of course, an extraordinary woman because she was the daughter of the last uh, emperor of East and West, Theodosius. Um, and um, she, she then, after her father died, went and got abducted, I suppose you would actually call it, by one of the Goths who was uh, 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 attacking Rome, and she ended up marrying the king of the Goths. Um, quite happy, but it seemed to be a success, but unfortunately for everybody, he was then murdered. Um, and so she then had to move on uh, and marry her brother, uh, general, who became an emperor in his own right eventually, until he died. And she then had to act for her son, who was also an emperor before he grew up to a certain age. So she was very much at the forefront of power. Um, But what I find so fascinating about her, um, these early people, unfortunately, you you are limited by the material you can look at, because all the reports tend to be either very much in their favour or very much against them. They're very black and white, the the accounts you get. Uh, So you have to weave your way through that. And I don't want to give any false opinions without pretty good backing up, um, proof to back it up. But I think 
even though there's not much left of, uh, her, of her time, when you go to Ravenna, you very much feel the spirit of this woman who, who influenced uh, affairs so much at that time and brought the sort of Eastern uh, art forms of, of Byzantium to Ravenna. And so, so much of the sort of beautiful things that we find in Ravenna are thanks to the ideas that came in with Bella Placidia. But after she uh, uh, died, um, her son was pretty unsuccessful and he didn't last long before he was assassinated. And then we move into this peculiar period when the uh, Western Emperor comes to an end um, and it's eventually ruled, uh, the ruler in the area, very much under the thumb of the East, is as a series of uh, so-called barbarians until eventually Justinian takes takes the area over completely. So it's a sort of a fascinating end of the period, but with these individuals, we're just beginning to see the, the arrival of, of real individuals here. Yeah. You are indeed. And I think if you're British and you go to, certainly if you go to Sicily, um, mm. you see very familiar um, castles studying the landscape and that's because they're Norman and that's yes. what we see here because we this catches people out doesn't it because the Normans arrived in southern Italy in the early medieval period and how does that change things for the Adriatic both culturally but also in terms of what's going on is it a, is it a frenzied takeover? Well it's it, originally they arrived um there's a sort of rather charming story that that a few knights were, were, were visiting the the um, holy sanctuary of, of um, uh, Monte Sant'Angelo on, on the um, uh, Gargano um, Peninsula. That's the spur of Italy, and they were visiting that, and then invited by the Lombards to come and help them. Now the Lombards had, had invaded northern Italy about 500 years before but they had been pushed south and they'd now taken over the, the virtually the whole of southern Italy but they were also having their own problems with the with the Greeks um, and at times the, the, the popes were interfering in all, all these affairs so they, they wanted some mercenaries to come and help them and the Normans really wanted uh, uh, there was a particular this family that later came down for the sons of this um a Tancred of Hauteville from northern France. He had a lot of sons. And of course, if you've got lots of sons, you've got to find a way that they can have their own land. And so they were basically coming down in the search of land as well as uh, coming as, as mercenaries. Um, and there were these, the, the two who we particularly sort of notice uh, were two of his younger sons, this uh, immensely tall, very impressive uh, Robert, uh, known as the Giska or the, the Crafty. Uh, and he uh, started by helping the Lombards. Eventually, like so many people, changed sides. But he um, he succeeded in 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 conquering uh, vast areas there. Even then, marrying the daughter of the last Lombard ruler in in Salerno, and, and becoming prince of Salerno, and becoming duke of of of, um, of, of Apulia. And he also invaded uh, across the Adriatic in the area that we would now call. Um, uh, Albania. So he was succeeding very much. And meanwhile, his brother, uh, his younger brother, Roger, was his vassal in, in Sicily. Um, and after Giscard's death, uh, the, it, the Roger has, um, had sort of really had uh, absorbed a lot of the territory of, of the Giscard's sons. And with that, when his son succeeded him in Sicily, he actually succeeded in becoming king of Sicily, Roger II of Sicily. And there he founded a really sophisticated court, very tolerant, very open-minded, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, one might almost say enlightened. And I think uh, the, the Normans certainly brought this new sort of... Uh, uh, Roger then adopted, uh, moved his reign, as it was called, his kingdom right into southern Italy, taking over from his, um, his uncle. Uh, the Giscard's area. And I think what you see there, um, they, they brought this sort of new culture to the area and certainly brought their, built their castle, but also this, this more modern world. And what I liked about the Normans, it was the first time, particularly, um, the Giscard had one extraordinarily sort of impressive, vast, very tall son called Beaumont. He was, it was a nickname given 
threatened him after a giant. Uh, he was particularly tall. And he's one of these uh, knights at this time who you actually really feel you get to know when you're going around Puglia. You find the buildings where he, that he built, uh, uh, there's the most beautiful, what they call the Sepulchre in, in Brindisi, which has just been restored, which was built to uh, house the um, crusaders when they would go off just before. Is this Bowerman of Taranto? That's right. Yeah, I love. Um, we've got a whole episode on him. I well, I, I find him fascinating because it's not only these wonderful buildings, but also you can actually see his tomb and his name is scratched on the door, mm. and they found some bones there. It's the first time I felt that you really were actually getting to the man. It wasn't just a, a person you were impressed by what you read about them, but you actually felt you were sort of touching the, bro- the stones and things of of this man himself. And it's the beginning of. The, the individuals being really living beings for me at least I think I want to rename Zach Zach the crafty as well yes yes <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry why am I being dragged into this don't act innocent you know, you know. <laughs> look, look I've got a reputation to maintain it might not be a justified reputation yeah, yeah, he thinks say. I'm the the baby face lovely whatever and in reality, I'm a baby face. on my phone for a year now. Exactly. <laughs> baby face assassin. <laughs> Let's talk Venice. We talked about Venice earlier. Um, <clears throat> because Venice, we're talking about rat bags. Some of the, the doges in charge of Venice were rat bags of the highest order. Um, obviously, it rises in the later medieval period. Arguably, it's one of the early earlier superpowers yes okay Roma a superpower but Venice very much a superpower in its own right does the geography of the Adriatic play a role in Venice's success being kind of tucked away at that top end of the Adriatic and therefore sort of arguably being less exposed when it comes to things like attacks it's a really sort of interesting question that one um I think I think there are various things that help Venice one was that um well, if we're talking about geography, first of all, I think the the, uh, the Venice in its lagoon, uh, that, that gave it certain protection. Uh, the shallow waters made it much harder for it to be attacked. And, with, and quite often when it came under attack, they would actually move the markers of, of the channels through the lagoon. So that, that made things even more complicated for people trying to attack it. Um, but they had from the start, I mean, there's, there's very early reference to the Venice's sort of democratic character because you, if you're all struggling to survive and it can't have been easy in the early days uh, they, they'd gone there to escape the, the the barbarians and life must have been extremely hard out on the lagoon um where you sort of survived on perhaps a few fish salt was a very important trade for them obviously to preserve all those fish but you know it was a question of survival and everyone sort of had to help each other otherwise everything would go wrong and so the sort of democratic spirit came that you didn't get quite the sort of competition you would get in a feudal society where people want to get rid of somebody that they don't like. You had to help each other. Um, and then once they started uh, uh, trading, they became extremely skillful um, mariners. So that helped them. And they, they used to they had all these trading stations all the way down the eastern um, coastline. Uh, they weren't aiming to sort of settle uh, further inland. So in a way, it just was quite helpful for the people who they traded with because it brought them the goods they wanted and, and financially was of some help. But they weren't a, a challenge to the the powers that be further inland, if you like. And they didn't really get involved in in sort of trying to expand onto um, terra firma till considerably later. And that's when things start actually getting worse for Venice because they're suddenly up at, um, it, um, being confronted by... Um, other members of the Lombard, uh, sort of, uh, the Lombard region. So, they, uh, so I think, in the sense, the fact that they were not um, exp- expanding in, in territory and things helped them be accepted by people. But um, as far as the Adriatic, where they are, there's a sort of certain disadvantage about um, the, about the Adriatic, and that was the very narrow um, entrance into the Adriatic at Otranton, down in the south in Puglia. It, at that, at the Straits of Otranton, at their narrowest, are only 45 miles across. So quite often they would 
run the risk of being blocked and unable to get out into the Mediterranean. And this sometimes was a cause for them going to war with, with the Ottomans or whoever was, were blocking them. So I think the geography possibly helped in some ways, but not in every way. And of course, once they began to become very um, successful, then the rivals from the, uh, the Western um, uh, uh, ports of the, uh, of, um, of Italy, sort of in the, um, uh, uh, places like uh, um, Genoa and uh, Pisa and and even um, Amalfi, they they were began to sort of see them as rivals in trade, and so there were a lot of problems they had with the Genoese over the over the centuries, and the Genoese then entering the Adriatic and taking them on. Uh, by the 18th century, they they after sort of two centuries of of um, being at war with their. Uh, with their um, land-based neighbours in, in, in Italy, um, they, they then decided to enter this period of determined neutrality. So through the uh, 18th century, they were trying to avoid war at all costs. So life was pretty, quite sort of easier for the people, that, but actually what the, uh, the powers that be were, they didn't really realise that they were heading for disaster because their neutrality meant that they weren't ready to protect themselves when the time came. <laughs> that you uh you have to you did the questions and there's no way you do this without shoehorning the little man in so go for it i always shoehorn in the podium <laughs> reference um <laughs> yeah. any opportunity to bash the guy over the head um, <laughs> because napoleon does stick his nose in i mean it, venice is, is kind of significant because venice becomes a, a bartering chip doesn't it mm-hmm. um when he's fighting the austrians in northern italy and um the austrians kind of wanting to retain control of venice and eventually napoleon going nah i'm having venice as well i'm having everything Mm -hmm. um but the the adriatic themselves not only does napoleon stick his nose in there he also uh sends um troops to to take dubrovnik at one stage Mm. um and the adriatic itself becomes quite a key point in the breakout of uh, war for the the second time in, in 1803 in terms of the negotiations that are are built into the Treaty of Amiens and people just not sticking to them on both sides, British and, and Russian and French, all kind of not sticking to their bargains and not being happy with what they negotiated. Talk us through how the region is affected by the conflict, but also we're talking about individuals and their stories um, within this. Byron rocks up when it's all over and has a, a pretty, I would say, a pretty key kind of impact on, on the region through his writing. So talk us through all of this, because it's quite a, a significant moment, I feel yeah. at least, within well, the Adriatic's history. Uh, I agree. I think that quite often um, the the uh, events in the Adriatic are forgotten when people are talking about the Napoleonic Wars. We think about um, the British and, 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 and French at war in the, in, in the West Indies, and we talk about them at Trafalgar and all the rest of it, and forget how much was going on in, in the Adriatic. And it was really because um, the British became extremely concerned that Napoleon, having pretty well conquered whole of, of the Italian peninsula, was now turning his attention to the eastern shores of the Adriatic with the intention that he would then uh, clear the way for him to, to, mark, to get access further east. And uh, Nelson summed it up neatly and said, you know, if, if this happens, it's goodbye to India for us. You know, we've got to be careful and protect this. So it became a very key area in the war, uh, in the wars. Um, and um, I think you said about uh, when it was over, Byron came down. But in fact, with the Baron's first visit, uh, to uh, when he came, was on his grand, uh, grand tour, he couldn't actually go through Central Europe as was the normal way because of the Napoleonic Wars were taking part. So he arrived via um, Gibraltar with his, um, his, his close friend and they went to Malta. And it was there that he was then encouraged to go and um, not go on to Constantinople as he was planning, but to go and, uh, and visit Ali Pasha, the, uh, um, the ruler in, 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 um, in um, Albania. Now, um, later, Baron rather sort of wondered whether he'd been played in this case, that he was being sent to sort of try and smooth the way for the British, because the British and the French were both competing for Ali Pasha's uh, support. 
again, because they wanted control of the area. Um, and Ali Pasha was off, also offering them the, the access to his forest. And that was a very useful source of timber for their sailing ships. So they really wanted to keep in with Ali Pasha. And Ali Pasha realized that he could play both, both parties. Anyway, um, Byron went there. He was incredibly impressed by what he saw. It was all so new to him. And so, as you say, he then went back, when he went back to England, he published his um, Child Harold, which was very much sort of drawing on what he'd seen uh, at Ali Pasha's court. And this very much trained, changed people in, in Britain, at any rate, um, views of, of this part of the world. They suddenly began to be rather interested in it. They hadn't thought about it before. But what he'd also done, uh, while he was uh, visiting Ali Pasha, Byron had also visited um, Athens and he'd been through what we would now call Greece. And um, so later, when um, Byron went back to England, he made himself so such an sort of object of, of appalling scandal that he thought, well, I'd better get out of the country. And so he decided to go and live in Italy. And he originally went and lived in, in Venice, where his life behaviour didn't change much, but he uh, sort of enjoyed himself there, until he met his um, a final sort of uh, important mistress, uh, who, uh, who came from Ravenna. So he went down to Ravenna. And while he was in Ravenna, he joined um, the Carbonari, which was a group of sort of protesters against, uh, it, there, was, there was a group of them down in Naples, and there was another band of them here in Ravenna. And this made him uh, uh, sort of very suspect, you can imagine, with the Austrian um, authorities. But it shows that he was already very much involved in these causes. And so it was at that point in, in, in 1823 that he thought, well, I'm going to go and join the Greeks in their fight for independence. And so set off back to Missolonga, Missolonga where he had actually been um, during his visit, uh, for earlier visit. Um, and of course, we all know that with by April of 1849, he, had, he was dead. He had um, courted um, uh, a fever, and I think the treatment he received was, was obviously made things even worse, and he died. So that was a sort of a, a, an offshoot, if you like, of that early visit. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning at this point, of course, this wasn't the end of, of the sort of general um, unrest that was building up right across Europe at this time, because by uh, a few years later, by 1848, the whole of Europe was, was, was um, being hit by these series of revolutions. And, and that would lead me back on then the next year in 1849, we have the great sort of uh, siege of, of Venice when um, this uh, one of the people who I find sort of particularly uh, interesting character, this man, Daniele Manin, this rather sort of um, humble, very intelligent, but very modest um, lawyer, uh, Daniel Manin, led the uh, resistance to, to the Austrian attack. Uh, it, it, it failed in the end, but it was a sort of real stand by Venice against um, against the, the uh, um, outside powers and crying out for uh, Greek um, Italian independence, which of course came to most of Italy in 1861. But even then, Venice didn't join till um, five years later in 1866. So it's a sort of interesting period this 19th century, going from the sort of Napoleonic Wars right through to the eventual success of Greek in, of uh, Italian independence. I think just to jump on a bit further now as well um, into my wheelhouse, uh, Sarajevo being in the Balkans obviously makes the Adriatic the epicenter of the ultimate excuse uh, for the outbreak of World War One. I. I love that Zach's written that because he now knows that obviously Franz Ferdinand, because he's heard Lockie and I rant on another podcast <laughs> about how Franz Ferdinand's forgotten within five minutes and is not the cause of the First World War. Uh, <laughs> but how is the region affected, uh, the Adriatic, particularly in the aftermath? Because the map of the region is majorly redrawn in 1919 as well and also I don't I wonder if you were as well because I was um shocked at the cultural differences in war in the Balkans and in that region that just are alien to us I'm, and I'm thinking of genocide I'm thinking yeah. of the fact that you don't just defeat your opponent you wipe out everyone they ever held dear um which which is a phenomenon um with the Austro-Hungarians and the Balkan nations in the First World War that's quite Shocking, I always think. Yes, um, well, I've, I'm, 
this is a big question, this one. Um, I mean, I, I, as far as why the, it became so bloody, if you like, um, I I sort of hesitate to, to give a, a, a decision on that one because mm. I, I, I one thing I don't want in this book is to take sides and say one side behaved worse than another. Yeah. And if one delves deeply enough, practically everybody's behaved badly at some point. Um, but and I think the thing is what happened with very much there was in um, 1908, the, the Austrians annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina. And the the Tsar really wasn't in a position to do anything about it. The Tsar was very much in the, in the uh, Serbian camp. They were fellow Orthodox. He he supported the Serbian cause in the past. Um, and uh, but the Tsar wasn't in any position to deal with Austria annexing Bosnia Herzegovina because he just come through this disastrous Japanese war and it was really in a rather weak position. So when then in, in um, 1914, uh, a, a group of Bosnians killed uh, the, uh, the Archduke Ferdinand when he was at Sarajevo, um, the, uh, the Archduke for, um, Franz Joseph was immediately said he was going to go to war against the Serb- Serbians. He, he blamed them for this, uh, this event. Um, to what extent they could be a- accused of being involved in it was always very much a question of doubt. I mean, the fact was they were Serbians. And admittedly, they come, I mean, they were Bosnians, but they'd come from Serbia. Um, and anyway, um, as a result, the Tsar wasn't in a position really to do anything. And very quickly, the, the, as we know, the situation built up and war broke out. Now, the Austrians then invaded Serbia. Um, and uh, the, the Peter of Serbia, uh, the old king, he was uh, he led his people in this great retreat. You know, they went down through Albania and eventually uh, were uh, uh, rescued, were, were, were taken by the British and others uh, to Corfu and got away. But they continued to, to stand up against the Austrian invaders. Um, but his neighbour uh, in Montenegro, Nicola, the king of Montenegro, he um, had um, he, he he was an interesting man because he had massive daughters who all married all around Europe. Uh, uh, one was married to the king of, uh, of Italy, another was married into the Serbian family, and and yet more were mar- married to senior Romanovs. So he was very much in that sort of world of 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 the of, 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 um, uh, the Russian world, if you like, um, and he had uh, had uh, declared war against Austria and fought uh, at one successful battle at the beginning, but then they were defeated, and um, and uh, whereupon he uh, uh, decided to go into exile in Italy, leaving a general in, in control back in Serbia, in, in Montenegro. Well, the general was faced by this unequal uh, problem, so he uh, surrendered, and. As a result, at the end of the war, whereas Peter was re- uh, uh, of Serbia was respected for having sort of led the resistance, even uh, even in exile, Nic- Nicola was forced to abdicate by his own people. Um, and so, when the uh, the the new Yugoslavia was drawn to, up together, it was called it wasn't uh, called Yugoslavia at this point. It was the Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, and Montenegro was included in that as well, uh, Bosnia and a few other places. But it wasn't mentioned in in the title, um, and of course, this was a real humiliation for Montenegro, who had actually played a part at the beginning of the war. So I think it was basically, it was people's reaction to the way their leaders had behaved at the, uh, during the war. That was one of the reasons the map was redrawn the way it was. Does that explain it all? <laughs> Brilliantly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you're, you're much better. Zach and I are far more waffly when we're trying to come well, to massive I, amounts I, of history. I wonder it. whether I've said something wrong. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> But this is a, your special special area, I imagine. I mean, the thing is, I am very quick to point out with my book, because I've attempted to cover such a vast spectrum, I'm always open to what the experts are telling me in each area. So I'm keen to learn the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think anyone who says they're done and they know everything isn't doing the job right, are they? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, we're running out of time, but there is one kind of, I do this with my guests. I don't know why, but I always drop just a really awkward question. Yeah, a really somewhere. awkward essay question that requires oh God, no, a week of research yeah, and 10,000 words. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you took a, a whole book to, to 
answer this question. I'm going to try and get you to do it in a couple of minutes. How key would you say this region has been in the history of Europe? There you go. There, there's a. You're so mean. <laughs> there's a horrific question for you to get your teeth into. <laughs> I think it's, I'm really going back to my first answer, it sounds rather like sort of people in law court, but I, I think it's the fact that it is an area that uh, has been on the border for so long, um, that, it's, it, that it was an area, um, particularly in the West, perhaps quite often we knew very little about what lay on the other side of the border, uh, um, it, it's particularly once <laughs> the Islamic uh, world was so successful and, and the Ottomans spread their empire so far. Um, I think people didn't sort of, rather it was, oh, there's a line between West and East Europe that goes down the middle of the Adriatic. And on the other side, they, they have a different religion, they have a different culture, they have a different language. And actually what I've tried to say is I don't think it was that. I think it is because it was a, a, a crossing point. It was also an area of connectivity between the two areas. And this idea that it was all rather another world uh, is possibly a rather more recent idea which is is wrong um well to me it's wrong but anyway and i think that it the very fact uh, coming back to your favorite area that was on napoleonic period you can see then how it was a, a real center of of um activity and and um different relations and things going on there then so i think apart from it, from its strategic uh, position of course we've also got to look at uh, things we haven't even touched on today but the things like the, the rich culture of the area the the uh, architectural the art the the um, uh, um just the whole cultural picture it, it means that it is a very important region in the world and it's not on the board of anything it's in the center of of everything that um makes us europeans Absolutely. I mean, there is a point, right, that Italy for a very long time was viewed as the centre of the heavily inverted commas, civilised world. Mm. Um, and the Adriatic is literally on the shores of, of Italy. So, you know, it, it is central and integral. And it's not surprising that it has such a rich culture because you've got so many ideas kind of passing through this region and, and being exchanged as a result of, of the intense amounts of trade that are going on. Um, but also the people that are passing through it on their, their way to and from Italy to, to other locations. Which and is... Italy itself was, was such a divided country until 1860. So that you've got the, the rich variety of cultures there too. So it's not just on the eastern uh, Medi- uh, Adriatic, you've got this mixture of cultures, you've got it in Italy as well. So it, it's a sort of complete sort of um, mixing bowl of, of ideas and, uh, and, and then so much. Um, uh, there's been so much input from other cultures from outside, whether it's the French or the uh, um, uh, the um, I, I, I hesitate to use the word Turks because that's is, is a detrimental term. But you know that, that sort of Turkish influence, all this was I- influencing the whole region. So um, it, it, that adds to its richness, I think. Caroline, this has been great. Um, <laughs> if people don't want to buy the book after this, I don't know what's the matter with them, folks. <laughs> Adriatic. It's published by Ambly. You can get it from Ambly or there'll be a link in the description. Go get it on the History Hype bookstore. You know the rent. Somebody by now has probably stuck it on a mug. Don't go to Amazon because Jeff Bezos is going to turn your money into rocket fuel. But if you really must go to Amazon to buy the book, go buy the book. (laughs) It's called Adriatic. Um, You'll also be able to find the Baltic story. We'll stick that on our History Hack bookshop as well. Caroline, thank you so much for this. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. And also, Betsy, best behaved puppy ever. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, I'm glad she hasn't let me down. (laughs) When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. 
Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.